Hi, everyone. Uh, good evening. My name is Jay Miller. And my name is Hazel Miller. And we are the co-publishers at Book Hug Press. It is our great pleasure to welcome everyone to the double launch of Cane Fire by Shani Mutu and Lunar Tides by Shannon Webb Campbell. Before we begin, we would like to acknowledge that the land we are joining you from this evening has for thousands of years been the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is still home today to many diverse Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. We are grateful to have the opportunity to live, gather, work, and learn on this land. We also acknowledge that many of you in the virtual audience are joining from other locations, and we encourage anyone who wishes to do so to please share an acknowledgement of where you're joining us from via the chat function found at the bottom of your screen. And if you're unsure of the history of the land under your feet, we highly recommend the online resource native-land.ca to learn more about the land you inhabit, the history of those lands, and how to actively be a better part of a future going forward. And additionally, if you haven't already done so, please feel free to post a greeting for Shani and Shannon in the chat. We are so delighted to be launching two powerful and moving poetry collections with you tonight. Cane Fire marks Shani Mutu's long awaited return to poetry. Akin to a poetic memoir, past and present are in conversation with each other throughout this collection as the narrator moves from Ireland to San Fernando and finally to Canada. The reinterpretations and translation of this journey and its associated family history give meaning to the present. Through these deeply personal poems and Mutu's own artwork, we begin to understand how a life can not only be shaped, but even reimagined. The Poetics in Shannon Webb Campbell's latest collection, Lunar Tides, follows rhythms of the body, the tides, the moon, and long, deep familial relationships that are both personal and ancestral. Originating from the poet's deep grief of losing her mother, Lunar Tides charts the arc to finding her again in the waves. Expansive and enveloping, these poems explore the primordial connections between love, grief, and water structured within the lunar calendar. Before we get underway, I just wanna go over a tiny bit of housekeeping. First off, live closed captions are available this evening. And to access the captions, please click on the CC function that appears along the bottom of your screen and follow the prompts. Secondly, tonight's launch is being recorded and the recording will be made available for on-demand viewing on our YouTube channel in the coming days. And lastly, just a quick word on the format for tonight. Shortly, we'll enjoy a reading from Shani, followed by a reading from Shannon. And after the readings conclude, they will be joined by special guest, Linda Mora, who will lead the two of them in conversation. The three of them will have a chat for about 20 minutes, and then Linda will open things up to questions from you, our audience. So if you have a question for Shani and or Shannon, please submit it using the Q&A function, which of course you'll also find at the bottom of your screen. Linda may not have time to get to all of your questions, but she will try. And our plan is to wrap everything up at around eight-ish. Um, <laughs> over to you. <laughs> if you haven't already purchased a copy of Cane Fire and or Lunar Tides, you may wish to order a copy or several directly from our website, bookhugpress.ca, or from your local independent bookseller. We'll drop links to the book's product pages on our website into the chat function during the event. And now, without further delay, let's begin. First up, it is our pleasure to introduce Shani Mutu. Shani Mutu is a poet, fiction writer, and visual artist. Mutu was born in Ireland, grew up in Trinidad, and moved to Canada in her early 20s. She is the author of several novels, including her most recent, Polar Vortex, which was shortlisted for the Scotiabank Giller Prize. Her first novel, the highly acclaimed Sirius Blooms at Night, is now a Penguin Modern Classic. She is the author of two books of poetry, her first, The Predicament of Ore, and the latest, Canefire, which we're celebrating tonight. 
Mutu's poetry has appeared in numerous journals and has been anthologized widely. She holds an MA in English from the University of Guelph. She is the recipient of a Dr. James Duggan's Outstanding Mid-Career Novelist Award and has been awarded an honorary doctorate of letters from Western University. Shani Mutu lives in Southern Ontario, Canada. And now over to you, Shani. Thank you. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Hazel and Jay. First of all, I'd like to say that I live uh, on, uh, on the traditional land of the Anishinaabe, the Wendat, and the Haudenosaunee peoples. And this is adjacent to the Mohawk community of Tayandinaga, and I'm deeply grateful to be able to live and work here. I also want, uh, since this is the official launch of my, uh, of my book, I, I want to say a deep thanks to Hazel and Jay, uh, whom you just uh, heard there, um, for doing an outstanding job with my book. When you get a chance to see it, you will see why I am so pleased with it. They also put me in touch with a fabulous editor, Sandra Ridley, um, who has become a friend now. That was an amazing uh, interaction with a book designer, Gareth Lind, and copy editor, Stuart Ross. I have to thank uh, Mike Godard as well for helping me to prepare the manuscript because there's a lot of um, photos and you know the, the layout was pretty difficult to present to the publisher um, you know, at first. And uh, Mike was very helpful with that. I wanna say thanks also to Marlene McCallum and David Morrish to Sheila Hurley and Jane Howard, to Nyla D'Souza, to Indrani Mutu Raymond. For, and these are people who have all been very, very helpful with reading the manuscripts and conversation and so on about things that I was writing about. To my sister, Valerie Mahavir, and to Deborah Root, my partner, both of whom the book is dedicated to. Um, and, uh, very, very special uh, hello to my high school literature teacher who is in the audience and whom I haven't seen in ages, Miss Irma Thomas. And this is where my love of literature all began. So it pleases me greatly that she's here tonight. Shannon and Linda, I'm so happy to be doing this with the two of you tonight. And um, uh, thank you very much, friends and family, and uh, all literature lovers who, are, who have come in from so many different places. Um, I'm going to read, Did Water Fall? It was definitely not the rockaby kind of rocking, nor did the world gently swing. I believe the ship's bells clanged. Of course, I would have wanted sanctum in her hands. The lights winked. I winked back. When she cried out, so did I. No one sang. I thought I heard when the bow breaks. More likely she'd have asked, will the bow break? He did not say hush or laugh. The water jug on the dresser trembled. I always hear her scream my name. Veranda. From city eaves dangled Jack Spaniard's papery nests, like schoolboys' term tests crumpled, tossed and caught in the black painted wrought iron garden that rose above rows of pots of curly leafed bread and cheese begonia lushly fringing the wraparound black-ledged veranda. And though your belly was full of cake and milk, you pressed each shell pink pillow of begonia for a soupçon smear of yolk yellow citrus sour and waited. And as you waited, you contemplated mechanics of disdaining, principles of taming, red-bellied, yellow-banded, Jack Spaniards. Then slowly below begins the babbling and the flow. You crouch behind your potted jungle and watch. 
the charm of girls in green skirts and white blouses glimmer through the latticed doors of a white walled madrasa whose golden star and crescent moon shine brighter than heaven's own stars and earth's own moon. And you marvel at how hummingbirds know why the musin sings and why at this time on the street below, white capped men in white dresses flow. Heaven's own stars. Darkness climbs stairs, seeps under doors. Night in a dress reeks patchouli and fire, shadow mischief crawling. Cloven hoofed Lajabless crouch in corners. He tilted my face to the butchery bloodshot sky. Behind his back, my finger looped inside his belt which he sometimes removed, coiled around one hand, its pointed tongue snapping the other's palm. Far away thunder, low rumbles inland, sheet lightning, tic-tac toes, the waistband of his pants warmed my hand. Those were days rain never fell. To Lajablas, Sukiyan, and Jumbi, he was salt. Look! His index finger pointed. Quickly wish, wish you may. Quickly wish, wish you might. But what wish? Wish for what? He was everything. Enough. A true story about an unreal marble. After lunch, heat cripples a butterfly. Galvanized roofs creak and ping, confetti of cane ash blankets the town. From Empire Cinema, three blocks black, three blocks back, a sitar hunts, a woman pleads to the midday still argent clouds that crown Sutton Street's exalted concrete and front garden house. In that front room, a willful child is made to rest atop tide-scented hummingbirds, iridescent green, hibiscus red. But the willful child herself takes flight. Through the window, up Mukarapa Street, past the abattoir, she pinches her nose to where turbaned vendors adorn library corner, banishing last night's gutter piss and broken bottles of booze with foreign perfumed foreign grapes and apples wrapped in purple paper. Back in the room on Sutton Street below the open window, passes by jiggity jig with baskets of provision and fig, chittery, chattery, envy, admire, Mars, bevy, a fuchsia poncetia. When shade releases the street corner, Big boys gather on her grandfather's factory floor and play pitch with bags full of pretty marbles. The willful child, eyes closed, rubs her cheek up, down, her grandmother's pale and ample upper arm. From the corner bureau call lullaby scents, kananga, couscous, cedarwood, bergamot, until she finds the crimson keloid twistable marble, arm nipple to suckle. Twist it off. It could be a big toe with which to pitch on the factory floor. Under the wobble whirl of their ceiling fan, the wriggling willful grandchild searches for that keloid thing, the thing on Ma's upper arm. Finding it, she sucks then ventures a little bite. Mama's brow furrows, eyes flutter shut. It hurts, baby, don't do that. rock a baby. A willful child learns to wait until Mama's eyes are still, then she tries again. Suck the keloid big toe, consider when and how to sever such a thickened scarlet scar. Of course, I'd keep it safe, rolled between my fingers, hidden beneath my tongue, my very own big toe with which to pitch and show big boys how to score.
All right, and then we have two more. This, this one is called 2,540 miles. Upon her tongue, the phantom marble twirls. In foreign beds, absence stretches full length beside her. The cane-ashed town, ticklish lover, jealous custodian, a blue in sepia. Nights, she bolts upright, skin sticky with recall. The window open, no air a swirl. The Syrian, his bicycle, the bell bellowed his ways. Olive oil, lilang, lilang, clothespins, vetivy. A sari flutters in the sky, loop de loops disambiguates the sitar's drone. On her side of spare tipped fences, painted silver, pink poinsettia. On the other side, the silver haired drunk man, a handsome man, wailed for his glass eyed mother. Blind birds flew through cane fire sweetened air. Between thumb and forefinger, a phantom of marble, crimson air. Out of the wound of night seeps chimera. Absence, a clever lover supine beside her. And finally, this one is called, We'd Always Intended to Test the Well Water. I was fine until you came along, my dear. Once upon a time, no one dared say, no way, move over, lower, higher. But things have changed. And now that you may go first is my dreaded fear. I'll be the mad woman scratching dirt for the birds and music we share. We whittled to I. Who will re rewrite our anthem? Together we aspire. I was fine until you came along, my dear. In this race, which of us will shed that first tear? If you're not here to say, God damn it, you didn't again turn off the fire? For so many reasons, the possibility that you go first is my greatest fear. Write out where the keys and passwords are. I will never remember who is owed, what to expect, when and what will expire. These duties I did just fine until you came along, my dear. But I've since forgotten how. And what if I were to go first? Who take care of you? Change the battery, call the plumber. Would you hire yourself a new driver? Nevertheless, that you could go first remains my greatest fear. The birds will still call your name, not mine, but it's I who will be here. Your love for them will keep me from turning this house into our pyre. I was fine until you came along, my dear, but things have changed. And now that you could go first, this is my greatest fear. Thank you. I am going to introduce Shannon to you. So Shannon Webb Campbell is a mixed indigenous Mi'kmaq settler poet, writer and critic. She's the author of Still No Word, that was 2015, recipient of Eagle Canada's Out in Print Award and I Am a Body of Land from 2019, finalist for the A.M. Klein prize for poetry. Shannon holds an MFA in creative writing from the University of British Columbia and an MA in English literature at Memorial University in Newfoundland and Labrador and is pursuing her PhD at the University of New Brunswick in the Department of English. She's the editor of Visual Arts News Magazine. Shannon is a member of Alipu Mi'kmaq First Nation and lives in Djibouktuk, Halifax in Mi'kmaq, Mi'kmaqi, yes. And Shannon's new book tonight, as you know, is Lunar Tides. Welcome, Shannon. Oh, well, Alan, Shani, that was such a beautiful reading. Um, I love hearing your voice and your poems are stunning. 
huge congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so excited for this evening. Um, as it's the official launch of Lunar Tides, I want to say thank you to Jay and Hazel for um, publishing this beautiful book and to my editor, Wanina Kirtan, who was such a gift to work with. Um, this book also features artwork by Amy Ash, uh, one of my favorite artists based in New Brunswick, a beautiful piece of hers. And, um, and it's a collection for my late mother, Diane Campbell. I'm going to start with the poem, Time, a biography, with a preface by Virginia Woolf. A poet is Atlantic and lion in one. While one draws us, the other gnaws us. If we survive the teeth, we succumb to the waves. One, beginning. A baby is born in a room to a body. Here's her mother's voice. The baby wants to return to womb water. What is this room? What is this body? Living is a stretch. Doctors assign sex. Only hours until you hear tides. Nothing prepares you for life. Born three months premature. Are the grandmothers in my body? Doctors don't like to answer these questions. Life becomes a quest of origin. Mother reminds us why light thins. Passing into night, you return somewhere like wind. A room, body, baby. Two, beginning middle. In the room, in my body, mother tells the story of breath. Falling out of her one afternoon, nearly an entire season too early, the nurses pushed plastic tubes up my nose, put me in a glass box. Was she in the room? Was I once in her body? Birth explodes a new kind of meaning. Nothing prepared my mother to mother. Sex assigned her body. The hospital staff told her to go on home. I needed to keep breathing. Nurses took me away and she was left to imagine holding her baby. Grandmother was islanded in time thousands of miles away. A room, a body, waves. Three, end. Grief takes up with body. Mother never peed in front of me. Illness yellowed her and took her socks. Palliative care is a 10th floor view with an aluminum garden overlooking the city. Called in the middle of the night to be with her. Kin piled in cars, drove downtown, followed highway lines. A woman who wanted us there when she stopped breathing. A mother whose body never felt at home. Death exhausts and spectacle. Nothing prepared us for our last morning together. Was I in the room? Was she in her body? I sat in the hospital window while her tiny 60-year-old body slept. I couldn't take my eyes off her chest, watching her labored breath become a final hour. It's okay to go. I imagined a baby cradled in my arms the way she once held me. Passing my baby to her, I cried oceans over them. This is the closest I get to giving her a grandchild. The room, the body, mother. The second poem I'm going to read is called Ecology of Being. And um, it was actually made into a classical music suite with several other poems by Duo Concertante. And they called their, um, their album Ecology of Being after this poem. And it was just released last month. Um, and I had the pleasure of working with Liz Howard at the Banff Center for the Arts. And that's where this poem came out of a workshop with her. And so if you want to look up the, the album, or there's actually a film made about it, it's pretty amazing. But you're getting the stripped down Shannon Webb Campbell version of this poem. Ecology of Being. In this thinner air, there is no need to ingest crystals. We are surrounded by the boreal forest at the breakdown of natural order. Within the great chain of chaos, we exist as intervention between land and sky, only to return from a journey to a place of familiarization. Forgo the power of selfhood. Pain is singular. 
It triggers memorable experiences if you embody new occult poetics. Between the self and this other thing, we make a clearing to find meaning, travel to trembling aspens and come upon medicines. We remember this leaf, make connections, experience seasons at their breaking point and reinvent our skin cells. So I, I was writing this collection as I was losing my mother and I was living in St. John, New Brunswick, um, spending a lot of time watching the tides come and go. Tides. Are whales deep thinkers? Ask the tides that chart the rise and fall on August's fullest lunar night, when the fish are jumping and your moon's bleeding. Tell me the answer at high tide. I'll ask you again at low tide, six hours and 13 minutes later to see if you mean it. Come back to the same spot. Ask the moon what day it is, work 24 hours and 52 minutes into a tidal rhythm. Tell me about the whale carcass, whose rotting body has washed to shore, harbor locals walking around holding their noses. Circle back and plant some cedar. It takes a village to dispose of a dead whale, their bones shipped away to a museum. Tell me the question at high tide, I'll answer again at low tide, six hours and 13 minutes later, to see if you remember. If whales are deep thinkers, do they know it, one, it takes one day and 52 minutes for a point on earth to be noticed by the moon? Humans believe logic is time. We're all shift workers here on the lip of Atlantic. I seem to have whale bones a lot in my poems. This is the second time that's happened. <laughs> um, I went to see an incredible uh, whale in Newfoundland last week at Memorial University. And I brought the book thinking, is it okay that I wrote this poem about you? Um, so this next poem, If I Wasn't a Fury, I wrote while I was working with Stuart Legere. Um, on his project called The Unfamiliar Everything, which is a theater piece at the Theater Center in Toronto. And we were also working with Ray Spoon, who's a fabulous musician at the time. And Ray and Stuart made this poem into a beautiful song, um, which it's starting to sound like everyone wants to make my poems into songs, but that's not really true. It's just been a wonderful <laughs> moment with these poems. Um, if I wasn't a fury, I would know where I come from. I wouldn't believe my bones were made of shit and shame. I could walk the land, speak with ancestors, know what to carry forward. But I don't know which plants are good medicines or how to braid sweet grass. I can't speak my language, hold a drum or sing myself home without crying. If I wasn't a fury, I would know where I come from. And Ray does this like really nice, I wasn't, you know, anyways. I won't sing it to you, but it's always in my head when I hear it. Um, so a lot of this book is to do with grief, but some of it has to do with love. And I also would like to say thank you to my partner, Andrew, for being so supportive um, through all these different uh, lunar phases. Midsummer spiraling a labyrinth. In a garden of tangles overlooking Grand Pre, my lover follows my footsteps. We ask ourselves, what do we need to know at this time? Neither of us remember the way in or know the way out. We seek clarity in ancient spirals, a geometry to release tidal tensions, open to all things non-rational. You can get lost in the morass when the moon is tired. Seeking the ephemeral, we enter intuitive realms, pilgrimage the symbolic openings. In the sacred circle of hearth, Lavender blooms in our bloodstream, sprites drift through star formations, ratios tune like musical instruments. Waves call us to center. A wavelength is not a maze or the suspension of truth. Making confessions in an herb garden, we meet again at the circle sculpture, lock eyes and walk back aligned. So the book is divided by moon phases. Uh, of course, it starts on new moon. And um, here we are at the waning Gibeah stage of the moon. 
<clears throat> excuse me. You were never a visitor to this world. On your deathbed, you wore lipstick, asked me to retrace your mouth, even though you could hardly speak. You wore vintage clip-on earrings, smiled a gap-tooth grin once you hid, a pink cashmere shawl around your shoulders. You didn't care for mint paper gowns. Even dying, you were all dolled up. You commanded the room. The nurse who shared your middle name couldn't get over your steady gaze the sea gray blue of your eyes. When my father took the subway to hold your hand for the first time in 35 years, I saw something I had never before. He told a story of when a boy met a girl, smashed together like bottles of Pilsner, only with a hammer, shards of glass scattered over grass until they lit the box of beer on fire. Called himself a bad actor, booze hound, caught up in his character. In our last moments together, you called me over to your hospital bed, whispered, tell your father it's time to go home. And I'm gonna finish with the poem uh, for Frida Kahlo as mother. It's the lightest poem in the book. I don't know if there's any light poems in here, <laughs> but uh, I'll try to leave you on a lighter note. Packing dollar store plastic flowers to tie my hair in pink and yellow marigolds to mirror your signature style. I call on you, call you mother, because I can't phone my own. She died. You're dead too, but your work sustains Mother Mexico. Your monkeyed self-portraits offer multiple selves. One subject, a fixed gaze, a steel brow, another self, orangey florals piled high. Selves becoming morning glory. Mexican chocolate, sunflower cosmos, almost good enough to eat. Um, I would love to have Shani and Linda Mora, who I will introduce for the next part of our evening. Um, Linda Mora is a very dear friend of mine, and she is the current Farley Distinguished Visiting Scholar at Simon Fraser University, and the co-host, uh, co-producer of the podcast, Getting Lit with Linda. Her book, Moving Archives, won the Gabriel Roy Prize in English in 2020. Welcome, Linda, and welcome back, Shani. It's such a pleasure. Thank you so much, Shani, for that lovely um, introduction. I'll just quickly say that I'm coming to you from Kanyakahaga territory, and I'm just delighted and honored to be here and to be able to moderate this session today. I realized as I was preparing for this launch that I actually met these two writers in the same month, in the same place, in April of 2017 in Ireland. <laughs> and um, it was a wonderful moment and a magical place if there ever was one. Um, and then I served as Shannon's external examiner for her MA thesis, and then Shawnee, we did the interview for Getting That With Linda, in which we reference the, um, there's an exhibit at Simon Fraser University, there are some people listening who are in Vancouver right now, there's the Writing Women Right Out of the Archive on the seventh floor of the Bennett Library at Simon Fraser, if you're in Vancouver, I recommend that you check that out, okay, um, and also there'll be a, an interview with Shannon forthcoming for Getting That With Linda, so we'll talk about that later. To start the discussion, I thought I would observe that one point of connection between these two collections of poetry, or one point of connection, is their attitude toward lineage and family lines. So there's work that's being produced now that takes on a certain posture toward family lines, parents, guardians, ancestors that can be rancorous or angry or resentful. And sometimes I feel that that kind of attitude sidesteps the fundamental humanity of the generations that precede us as if they're being asked to live up to some impossible standard but that's not what we get here at all there are these loving um, and tender tributes that are at times celebratory and at times mournful um, in your respective 
collections. Um, so I was thinking, for example, um, in your Shawnee, the, uh, the Crick and the Crack, um, and in yours, um, Shannon, a uh, time, a biography. And so I wondered if the two of you would take turns just characterizing and speaking to the nature of those tributes and what your collections accomplish in view um, of these kinds of origins. Perhaps we could start um, with Shawnee. Yes. Uh, first of all, I want to say, Shannon, I really enjoyed reading your book, but then hearing you. Thank you so much. Those poems are like so beautiful. Yeah. They were. And, <laughs> and um, right. So, Linda, um, you know, I live in Canada with um, um, hardly any family around. Uh, no, no one really who knew me when I was growing up. I have a cousin in Toronto, Nyla, who she knew me when I was growing up, but we don't see each other enough. There's no one, no one whom I could call a witness, as it were. Mm -hmm. And as I get older, I find that I, I want to catch the stories. I don't want to forget them. My, my mom, who would have known stories, she has passed on. And um, I, I, wanna, I wanna write things down and hold on to them. Now, why do I want to do that? I don't know, because I'm a storyteller, I suppose. And I need to have a story about myself. It's kind of weird writing these other stories when you don't have a story for yourself. And as I begin to write them more and more, I, I remember more things, and this is um this is really what it is. It's about catching memories and holding on to them. Shannon, yeah, I can really relate to that. Like I I think um, uh, I started out as a photographer and wanted to photograph people to kind of keep them in a way, and then I think now. Um, the poems are a way to spend time. Um, you know, I do think, what would my mother actually think about these poems that I'm reading about her? Mm -hmm. Yes, I don't think she would love it, but um, in some ways it's, you know, it, it's not that I wanna preserve that part of her forever, but I also wanna talk about grief and I don't think there's a lot of places for that. Um, but also my father uh, finds his voices in a lot of my work and um, certainly I'm a body of land and uh, he had a stroke so he's even you know his voice and his vigor in life is very different so I almost feel that preserving him has been important and I didn't know that that's what I was doing or my mm -hmm. grandfather is in there a lot too and uh, he's 89 he's still here and and he kind of laughs. He, he's like, I'm in the poems, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think it's, I think there's something about holding on. And then also, I think you, I, you know, I love my family. They're, it's all complicated, but when somebody passes, it's this extraordinary event that like, wow, they were here and now they're not. And somehow in the poem, because I did, I did write about my grandmother's death and still no word too. And I'm pretty sure she wouldn't have loved that. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, I kind of think, you know, well, that we'll talk about it at some point later in another lifetime. But um, yeah, I think it's the postcard or the uh, mm -hmm. letter in the drawer. That's that leads into my next question, actually, that that image of the letter in the drawer, the postcard, in some ways, the poems, and so they kind of work that way. But I was also thinking in relation to my own research in women's archives. So in your poetic reflections or ruminations, both of you tend to invoke or call upon materials, um, photographs, scraps of letters, images, nursery rhymes, hymns. So in your case, Shannon, uh, post Postscripts and Moon Tea is one poem or Our Little Girl's uh, Book in another. And in Shawnee, yours, um, Inventory or Rocking Chair. Um, what role do you think these materials serve? Why even use them or invoke them? And as a follow-up question to that, how might we see the body as one such archival document? So twofold question, one is, what role do you think these materials serve, like the hymn or the nursery rhyme and so forth? Um, and the second question is, might we see the body 
as one such archival document. Mm -hmm. So those hymns, um, I and 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 some of those things that are in the drawer that were in the drawer of my grandfather, they were, um, you know, that that was all before I was ten years old. He died when I was about ten years old. My grandmother died when I was about six years old, and I lived with them for the first five years of my life. So, um, so it really it is an attempt to recreate a story, as I said before, um, to, to create a child out of myself. And some, some of the things that, they're very fragmented because I don't have anyone, as I said, back, back at that time to tell me who I was, to remind me of that time. So I am actually also leaving things out. There's huh. a lot that I have left out that is unpleasant. And I've consciously left it out because as I recreate myself, I mean, those things exist. You know, you try to create a story of yourself um, that is truthful. And I know that those things exist elsewhere in public. So I don't need to do them in every body of work. But in this body of work, I left things out. I left things out specifically about the body because I want to create a new body, not body of work, but a new physical me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's an interesting strategy. So, yeah, that's really yeah, interesting, Shani. The lies, the, the lies and the, um, it, there's no room for lies right now. It's like the truth, the truth, the truth. And what you leave out is not lying exactly. Yeah. That's fascinating. Shannon. Hmm. Uh, I mean, what in, for, in terms of my poems, like what was left out, like, you know, I, I end up with my baby book and my father's family is not written in there at all. And I think, wow, okay. Like that ended up in the poem because I wanted to kind of take it up with my mom in a way that maybe I couldn't have asked her in, mm. when she was alive. Um, but also like my grandmother's voice comes in because I found a letter that she wrote on the back of a bank statement. And I think there is in, in like searching or seeking and certainly in terms of um, moving through the very strange terrain that is grief, um, finding someone's voice again, right? So like my grandmother had a pretty commanding voice and it's, <laughs> it's even, you know, it's still ringing through me. And I, I think back actually when, when we launched I'm a Body of Land and, and Lee Miracle saying, you're born with your mother and father's voice inside you. And I think in some oh, ways wow. poems are an attempt to like honor their voice, honor my own voice, probably learn to speak too. Cause I think in my life I've been pretty shy and mm -hmm. poetry was a, as a place to, to be a little braver. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think I mean, there's many times all kinds of materials end up in a poem. Um, there's, you know, there's lots of poems about theory and things from theory classes. Um, but I think that the personal, like I, I do think, you know, my my family matters and matters and I matter. And um, that's part of what I, some of my writing is about is like, you know, this, this, we were here. And I think that preservation, like Jenny was sort of saying is trying to restore yourself. I hadn't um, you. I hadn't put this in my list of planned questions, but um, Shannon, you were referring earlier to the fact that you're you have a pass as a photographer, and Shawnee, I know you have a, a pass as a videographer um, and as an artist as well. And I wonder if um, that that past work informs your poetry in any way. Well, you know. Um... So the, the last three years, I had a little bit of trouble <coughs> in, with my health. Mm. And um, I, last year, I, I was worried. I was very, very worried. And I found myself wanting to pull together um, the work of the past as well. So, so in fact, um, this book, Cain Fire, does have um, 
uh, work, uh, artwork in 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 the yes you know uh, throughout that the the artwork is not just um artwork by itself they are yes they are part of the the poem so like this one reads the inevitable theater some of them. Um, desire but the the word the images say what my eyes see and then, you know, this one, is, there's a canoe in the middle there. Mm -hmm. And then that one says, I dream of doing. So I've embedded those into the, the book, into the poems. They've become part of the poem. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and it spreads throughout. So they are part of the poems. And um, once I finished Polar Vortex, I felt a freedom with Polar Vortex that I hadn't felt for a long time. It was like going back to writing the first novel, um, Serious Blooms at Night. Yes. The two of them work, the, I worked on them in the same manner. And I feel that Polar Vortex has the strength of Serious Blooms at Night. And once I had done that, mm. I felt a tremendous freedom. And I thought, just work the way you want to work. And that's what Cane Fire was. And so it brought my, my, um, my, uh, my, well, there was a photocopy works uh, with a bit of photography and so on worked in and the poems. Yeah. I don't know if I've answered your question, but that's uh, yes, how I have. got those together. Yeah. Yeah. Shannon, did you want to add anything to that or? I just absolutely loved the visuals in Shannon's book. Yes, I know. That's oh, what I was that's holding a nice of people you. to see. <laughs> yeah, and I, yeah, like as a lover of visual arts and I just thought, Wow, can you're just taking poetry book to the next level. Thank you. Um, I'm I have a couple of other questions, and then um, if there are if there are any questions out in the audience, I'll also be happy to represent those um, in the conversation. I had a question about the larger poetic structure and genre that you both opted for, and I'm, I'm not speaking about the individual poems now, but rather the structure of the collections proper. So, for example, Shani, um, I don't even, I, I, in our interview for Getting Lit with Linda, you said that you don't really see the collection as strictly poetic. In the interview, you say that you see it as more than that in some ways. Um, but in your particular collection, it's divided into three unnamed parts, which is not the case for you, Shannon. Um, it, you have the kind of named structure, a kind of, um, well, I'll let you uh, describe it. So why did you set up the poems in the way that you did um, in both instances? Shannon, maybe you could start Shannon? us off with that one. Um, well, my book is structured by the moon phases, right? Yeah. So we started the new moon. And um, that's that was sort of a part of the process because suddenly the moon was in all of my poems. Um, and I thought it would just show, you know, some sort of structure to how like grief is unstructured. And mm. the book, in a way, I mean, I think there is, there's the we start with the death but there's also lots of love in there and memories and um you know moments with the land and um but I think the moon was the constant and was a way to to chart the tides of all this mm. and contain grief if something can contain grief mm -hmm. it has a kind of cyclical there's a moment um in one of your poems Shannon uh, you're describing the act of breathing um, in relation to the poem. And it almost felt like we, I was doing a yoga pose <laughs> while I read it. And I, some yoga. <laughs> <laughs> I somehow felt that that also informed the structure, you know, that kind of the exercise of breathing and moving in this, in this kind of rhythmical way. Um, Shani, what about yours? How would you describe the structure? Well, um, so Jay and Hazel definitely helped me um, structure this. And the, the um, and Sandra, and the way that we worked on this was to, the 
the first section is basically um, poems about my grandparents and that childhood in Trinidad. And um, uh, the middle section is the, the longest poem, The Crick in the Crack. And that sort of moves from that childhood to the death of my grandmother to um, living with my parents and coming out in the end as an adult trying to basically court my mother with whom I did not have um, a, an absolute bond. And then, the, um, and thankfully by the time she passed away, I did have that bond, mm. but that's middle section. That's what that was. And then the last section is a sort of more contemporary me, who I am now. But um, when I say that the book is not entirely um, poetic. I, I should clarify that. But you see, the, the only poem that has a sort of a traditional structure in it is um, the, the Villanelle, the one that I, the last one that I wrote um, uh, about testing the well water. Um, and um, what I have found is that when, you know, thinking about um, forms, uh, traditional forms of writing, poetry and so on. I find myself wanting to reject them. And the reason is that to me, the um, um, poetry is a place like art where I can reinvent myself, not or not reinvent myself. I shouldn't say that, but where I can be myself. Mm. And much of my life I have spent apologizing for myself or fighting to be who I am. And I always feel that this is a place where I do not want to be bound by rules. I want to break the rules. I want to be free. And this is, this is what I loved about being able to move all over the page and um, to treat the page, the, the blank page, as in fact, not a blank page, but part of the canvas of the, um, of the writing. Yeah. I love that you're using um, the metaphors of the artist, the canvas of the page and so forth in order to describe the very act of writing the poem. Yes. Shannon, did you wanna add anything to that or not necessarily, <laughs> no pressure. Like, yeah, rule breaking, I'm 100% <laughs> here with you. <laughs> um, and that, that art and poetry can be this place and, um, it's, I find it sometimes is like a reconciliation with myself, like parts of myself that feel fragmented and somewhere I can, I don't know, put the fury or something, right? And then also the tenderness, but also break some rules. And I think being a poet in general is breaking a rule. Yeah. <laughs> it's the job. It's an extremely necessary place, I find. And I have to say that I probably love it more than writing a novel. Oh, because, how so? Well, I think in the novel, I mean, you know, I, I do love the novel when I'm writing it and by the time I've finished, but there's something really immediate and more truthful about, about the sort of the slap of the, the, the poem, the slap meaning you do it, which doesn't mean that it does not get um, revised and revised and revised, but it's there. Whereas the, the book is a constant explaining of what and how and why all the way through, you know. Is that the difference for you between writing poetry and prose? That's one of the differences, yeah. The others being? <laughs> 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 Not to put you on the spot, Shani. <laughs> yeah, I, it, um, my head is so much in, in the poetry right now that, um, I, I mean, the thing about a novel for me that I love is the invention of the entire story, the, 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 the creating of it. The thing that I do not like about fiction is the invention of the story, mm -hmm. the constant creating of it you know it's the kind of like you're 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 telling something that isn't true and you're constantly making it up now I love that but the thing that I love about the the poem is that it is um, a place where 
you can you can be brave you can be mm. really brave you can dare Shannon, do you feel the same way about poetry? Well, as I'm struggling to try to write my first novel, um, I love poetry. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's like you know you can you can feel like you got something done. <laughs> I wrote a poem. I did it. Uh, the writing of a novel to me is so daunting and terrifying and to like to stay in that story where I I miss the like the flirting about or the the fluttering mm. or the the thunder of poetry like there's there's something um yeah I feel like I got something done <laughs> there is a there's a, a question from the audience uh, well, there's actually there are several here's one does your cultural background or heritage influence your writing that's one of the questions that's come forward I'm sorry, can you say that question again? Yes. Does your cultural background or heritage influence your writing? Do you want to answer, um, Shannon? Um, I mean, I think because I wasn't raised in my culture, that the background, I'm always questioning it or asking it in my poetry, you know, like, what is my relationship to being Mi'kmaq and what is my responsibility? and um, and how, how does this inform my poetics and my worldview? And I think that it certainly informs my questions and is a, like a driving force in all of my work and uh, is really entrenched in the novel too. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Um, well, you know, go ahead, John. Sorry. sorry, I was going to say when we met in Ireland, I had begun to try. If you remember, I was one of the things that I was talking about was trying to be in Canada and not always be in Trinidad, writing in Canada um, about Trinidad, um, always longing for Trinidad or speaking to Trinidad. So um, I wanted to. To, to find myself here, to find um, Canada. And I don't know what has happened. I started that project, got mm. really excited about it, did a lot of work, particularly photography. And the last two novels were very much, you know, set here. But um, more recently, I've gone back to, uh, um, and I think it probably has something to do with having gotten ill last year. And, um, mm. um, and, just um, realizing that I have these two Englishes, as it were, English of here and the English of Trinidad, two landscapes, two set of loves here and there. And um, I'm always juggling them. And maybe the thing that has happened in the last little while is I'm able to pull them together rather than have them separate now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a, another comment from one of the attendees. Congratulations to you both, Shannon and Shawnee. Putting yourself out there creatively is no easy task. Well done to you both and your creations. Shawnee, can you comment on the differences that you experience between expressing yourself through writing as opposed to painting or photography? And I would level the same question at Shannon thereafter. Yes. Um, for the, um, the, the writing, does uh, allow me to use verbal language, obviously, in a, in a way that, um, you know, like I, in painting and photography, there's an immediacy. I, I've, I used to practice actually in painting and in a body of photography that I did at one time where I try not to let um, verbal language dictate what it is that I was doing. So it was a more sort of um, subconscious um, response um, or response, not response, but action towards painting and, um, and making photographs. And, uh, you know, I actually tried to do that um, with, uh, with, with words and basically mm -hmm. catch the bits of language floating in the air and two poems in the book, the only two poems written outside of the last two years or two and a half years came from that period about 30 years ago, or maybe even longer than that. 
And um, those two poems, um, Ancestry and um, Fine White Line, uh, Ancestry goes, I forget how it goes, it's just four lines long, but um, five lines. My mother was an Anglican, my father was a priest. Together they prayed real hard. When spring came and the pitch lake overflowed, they reaped the smoothest stones you've ever seen. Now, my father is not a priest. My mother is not an Anglican, but I wanted to grab on to whatever was floating in my head and to use it like that. Um, now, verbal language allows me to make sense and making sense, particularly in the last six years of Canadian life, living next door to a country where we you know, came to not know what was truth and what was not truth. Mm. Verbal language um, is really important to me right now to ask the questions, to answer them, to be very specific, to find the right words and the right language constantly, you know, not just uh, not just toss off um, the quickest thing. Yes. Oh, here, here. Yes. Um, Shannon. So the question was, again, expressing yourself through writing as opposed to, in your case, photography. Um, I mean, they're different, right? Like I, I think in photography, I'm always seeking beauty, right? I mm. often take pictures of beautiful things, but simple things. Um, and I, I, I think I'm searching for beauty in poetry too, but um, the aesthetic can be a little bit different. But I do think back to why I ended up in writing was that my mom was like you'll never make it as a photographer so I'm like oh well I'll become a poet <laughs> um, you know my plan maybe I'll go to art school after this PhD who knows but I, I still think there's things that happen in the visual that language can't do but I don't think I have found maybe my art like a voice as a visual artist or if I would be or um, but that was always my dream so it's interesting I think that I was drawn mm -hmm. to poetry which has such a visual aspect to it. Visual component, um, yes. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, I think Rachel has uh, suggested that she would like to answer this question live unless I've misunderstood that, but I have that as a note. Um, and I know we're just now creeping over eight, of, uh, you're welcome, uh, that was um, to our attendee. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, um, I, we're just slightly over eight o'clock. And so um, I believe I should turn it over now to nope, go on, good to move on. <laughs> she says, that's fine, good, okay. Um, I almost hesitate. If you can, can we add, we'll, we'll just add or ask one more question or one or two more questions. So I'll, I'll wait to see if there's any, any more from the audience. But I had a question um, in relation to, to something that you raised earlier, Shannon, you were talking about theory. And of course you have a couple of poems that reference theory. And I know that Shawnee really thinks through theoretically what she's trying to do. So one of the poems in your collection, Shannon, is I need to be held by something other than a theory, which I love. Um, do you have theoretical concerns that inform your work? And that question is for both of you. What kind of theoretical questions inform your work? So we've been talking about interdisciplinarity as one example, or thinking through the absences of, um, of lineage and, the, and the, uh, that is, for example, Shani, you were talking about how you wished you had asked your mother particular stories. And Shannon, you have been saying that you were thinking about um, how, how much is missing um, in terms of your story and your and your lineage. And so um, do you have other theoretical concerns that inform what you choose to write about? Either one of you. <laughs> you can go ahead, um, Shannon. Because of your, your poem, the, the specific poem. Oh, I need to be held by something other than Well, theory. there's there are two actually. So there's the other one is uh, how theory works. Mm -hmm. This is uh, on page 79 of your text. Um, and so I, I love it. It's very um, cheeky. It's a very cheeky poem. <laughs> 
So um, theory isn't a church. Theory cracks things open. Theory blooms, theory ruptures, theory feminizes, theory cock blocks, theory has consequences. I heard you read that poem live, actually the whole thing um, and thought, and so I, I think, and yet there is theory that is informing what the two of you do. <laughs> I almost read that poem. I was like, should I read the theory poem? I mean, <laughs> I, Thanks for reading it. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. Um, you know, I think I feel like I'm fighting back to the theory that I've learned or some of it, right? And I think going through graduate school um, makes you kind of angry with theory and exhausted by theory and overwhelmed. But, you know, after all of this reading and all kinds of theories, like it, it's, it's, shifted the way that I think about my own writing and you know mm -hmm. there's indigenous theory and queer theory and you know very fascinating theories I don't know how I see my own work in any of this okay. um, but I I really felt like in that the title I need to be held by something other than a theory I mean uh, that was like a desperate cry <laughs> <laughs> I wondered if that was it itself, that you you have a theory of embodiment, that is that you're really concentrating on an embodied response to the world around you. I thought that might be a, a kind of counter response to it, possibly. Yeah, well, and I think the, the body itself, like, can we theorize the body? Like, isn't the yes. body going to overthrow all this theory, all this thought that we, we invest so much in? We will die, you know, we will... We succumb to illness and these kind of things. I don't know. I, I don't have a very smart answer for this. Experience. That was actually quite smart. Oh, <laughs> from my no. point of view. Yeah. <laughs> I, it's, a, I, it's a really um, fabulous question and a big, big question because there is so much that we must be careful about in, in all that we know today about how we have hurt each other in the ways that we um, have written uh, about each other and how to mm -hmm. do that, how to write responsibly without, with, without um, in, invisibilizing um, um, people and situations as well. So how do you do both things at the same time? Also, there are things, in talking about poetry, there are things that poetry can do that fiction can't do, coming back to that, but yeah. also that theory, I believe that theory can't do. And this is really, it's so funny you would ask this question because I don't see it as um, relevant to cane fire quite so much as to something else I'm working on right now, huh. which is very much about the history of um, the Caribbean and the history of people like myself from India into the Caribbean, born in Ireland, living in Canada. And I mean, I'm struggling with it because how do you write, how do you write? Uh, like there are things about poetry that um, ask you sometimes, I suppose, not to be entirely clear, to mm. let the reader let the reader um, find out. Mm. And yet, to my to my mind, there are certain stories that you cannot afford to let other people put their stories within inside of it. You've got you've got to put it down. How do you do that? How do you? how do you write this very very important stuff and keep it as poetry it's not it's not easy and and um and make it um and and say what you want to say that you feel hasn't been said with all the history and all the theory that is out there mm -hmm. how do you say it clearly keep it as poetry not allow it to be pure history Mm -hmm. but not leave it not leave not leave this not, not leave things out creating you're creating a kind it, of porousness if you will yes yes 
But the thing that I do love about art and poetry and these kinds of things is that one, I feel, can risk failing. We live in a competitive society and, you know, it's failing is not, um, if there's conversation to be had around feeling, that would be fabulous. Mm -hmm. You know, we can discuss and really say, okay, well, maybe you could do it this way or that way, you know. That's excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, If there are no other questions from the audience, and it doesn't look like there are, I will just remind everyone um, to quote Shawnee, let the reader find out, let the reader find out. (laughs) You can purchase your copies of Lunar Tides and Cane Fire from directly from uh, Book Hug Press. Um, And I do recommend them. They're absolutely wonderful. I enjoyed reading them so much. Um, Thank you both for your wonderful readings and your wonderful collections. It's been a a real privilege and a pleasure for me to be able to speak to you um, about your your work. Thank you so much. Thanks lots, um, Linda and Shannon. Thanks a million. I'm so glad we did this together. Thank you. Both of you is amazing. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you so much. Well, we are back as well to say our um, thank yous, first of all, to you, Linda, um, to Shani and and to Shannon for such an engrossing and engaging conversation. We almost forgot we had to come back on. (laughs) Of our own, um, because we've just been so enraptured in listening to all of you. So. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thanks so much. It's yeah. been such a lovely uh, way to spend an evening. It really has been. <clears throat> um, but yes, I guess it is our our, our turn to um, uh, wrap things up. So, um, and it's such a shame because it is, it's just been such a lovely evening, but, uh, but yeah. we, we must. <laughs> I know, it's so sad. Things must come to an end, but here we are. But yeah, thank you so much, Shannon and Shani, for trusting us with your work. Thank you. It's been a tremendous honor to work with you on these books and to see them come out into the world and celebrate them tonight with you. It's just been so wonderful. And we're really excited for readers everywhere to read and engage with these really moving poetry collections. And thanks too to Linda for such a wonderful conversation tonight. It's been so thoughtful and and engaging, Mm -hmm. so wonderful. Uh, And we'd also like to thank Alex Spears who's been in the background managing the tech for us today. Thanks Alex as usual. And thank you as well to Rachel, Gary, and Charlene Chow for their work organizing tonight's event and for helping to manage the Zoom backstage as well. <laughs> and of course, thanks to everybody who joined us tonight. Uh, it, you know, if there's no audience, there ain't no show. And uh, <laughs> it's been a lovely show tonight. And I'm glad you were all here to, to join us. Um, Shannon or Shani or Linda, do, you, do any of you have any final words that you'd like to <clears throat> part with tonight? You know, I always have something to say and I want to say thank you. <laughs> Sorry, but thank you so much to all the people who have joined in tonight. And I see people coming from places where the time differences are kind of scary. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Indeed, yeah. indeed, indeed. Um, yeah, absolutely. And to all of, uh, all of you out in our audience, um, just one last plug of course if you haven't purchased the books yet of course they are available uh, on our website there's linda holding them up thank you linda <laughs> i know that rachel has busily um, been dropping the links into the chat throughout the evening um but of course you can just hop onto our website or visit your local independent bookseller um and that's our son calling i don't know if you can <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, perfect timing um but anyway thank you one and all for joining us thank you again um shannon shani and linda and to everyone else uh we wish you a great rest of the evening be well and good night to everyone thank we'll you zoom we'll zoom wave out <laughs> okay. okay bye